Well, think back for a moment. When you were a child, were you ever afraid of the dark? Well, for some, that was a real fear. Perhaps they thought about that imaginary monster that just lurked underneath the bed, and they just knew that one day that monster was going to come out and cause a problem. Well, if you're four or five years old and you're afraid of the dark and you feel that there is an imaginary monster, that's a real fear. You just know it's going to happen. But what about that same person who now is an adult? Do they still feel that there's an imaginary monster just hiding underneath the bed? Well, no. For an adult, those fears are now absurd. Well, so some critics say, why not go a step further and put the devil in the same category? No more real than a child's imaginary monster. Well, could that be? Is there really no devil? Is that possible? That's exactly what one religious pamphlet assures people. This religious pamphlet says, quote, The Bible knows nothing of such a monster of evil. And then it says, In the terms devil and Satan, we have the principle of sin and wickedness, which is inherent in human nature. So, is there really a devil? And if so, how do we know whether or not he exists? And if he does exist, well, how can we protect ourselves? And what dangers are involved? So those are some questions that we'll, we'll discuss here in our discussion. But first, it's good to get a rounded out view of how others feel about the devil, especially today. Uh, so many people today believe the devil is just like that child's imaginary monster. And isn't it true the popular view depicts the devil, say, in a cartoon-like state, in a red outfit, has a pointy ears, a long tail, and a pitchfork? And sometimes that cartoon character may pop up on one shoulder, representing the bad conscience of a person, whereas an angel will pop up on the other. So really, no, no reality to this wicked one for so many. In fact, notice what Julio said. Julio made this comment. He says, I grew up in El Salvador... When I was disobedient, my mother would say, the devil is coming to get you. And I would reply, let him come. See, he believed in God, but he did not believe in Satan. And many people today feel just that way. Now, some modern theologians go a step further. They argue that the devil is a product of myth. That it's just a symbolic personification of evil and nothing more. Then there's atheists. They believe there is no God and thus no devil. But what about Christians? What about true Christians? Well, they believe the devil is a spirit person, but also a very powerful spirit person. Well, just how powerful? Let's turn our Bibles to 1 John chapter 5, and we'll notice verse 19. 1 John 5, and notice this thought in verse 19. So there we're told, we know that we originate with God, but notice this. It says the whole world is lying in the power of the wicked one. So the entire world, this entire world system is in Satan's control. So very powerful spirit being. But how do we know that? How can we prove that this devil exists? Well, the Bible portrays the devil not as some personification of evil, not as some myth, but as he truly is an evil person. And the Bible is the chief source of evidence to show that. It uses the word Satan 54 times and the word devil 33 times. So what does the Bible have to say about this wicked one? Or we can ask ourselves, what accounts or scriptures could I use to help show how the devil is real and how dangerous he is? Well, perhaps this account, and this is our first picture, perhaps this account in Job, chapters 1 and 2, which tells about a dispute between Jehovah and the devil. We basically have a window into the heavenly realm on a conversation that took place with Jehovah and this wicked one. Let's go to Job chapter 1. And we'll pick up the account in verse 6. So Job 1. And as we read it, we have to just ask ourselves, first of all, is this someone real? Is this someone that Jehovah is speaking with? So Job 1, starting with verse 6, it says, Now the day came when the sons of the true God entered to take their station before Jehovah, and Satan also entered among them. Then Jehovah said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered Jehovah, From roving about on the earth and from walking about in it. 
And Jehovah said to Satan, Have you taken note of my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth. He is an upright man of integrity, fearing God and shunning what is bad. At that Satan answered Jehovah, Is it for nothing that Job has feared God? Have you not put up a protective hedge around him and his house and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his livestock has spread out in the land. But for a change, stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your very face. Then Jehovah said to Satan, Look, everything that he has is in your hand. Only do not lay your hand on the man himself. So Satan went out from the presence of Jehovah. Well, first of all, is Jehovah talking to a myth? Is he talking to an imaginary monster? No, this is a conversation. As we see, it's in the heavenly realm. We see Satan is accusing Job and all of mankind of serving Jehovah just for selfish reasons. But don't we see also his wicked personality come through? Do you notice he has no respect for Jehovah's sovereignty? This is someone we love deeply, our heavenly father. And he talks to him this way. So no respect for Jehovah. Now, let's continue. Verse 13 onward, and again, we'll see how human life is now involved. It says, Now on the day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The cattle were plowing and the donkeys were grazing beside them when the Sabaeans attacked and took them, and they killed the servants with the sword. So people, they died. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another one came and said, Fire from God fell from the heaven and blazed among the sheep and the servants and consumed them. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another one came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and made raids on the camels and took them and they killed the servants with the sword. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another one came and said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Suddenly a great wind came from the wilderness, and it struck the four corners of the house, so that it fell on the young people, and they were killed. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. So again, is this a myth? Is this a cartoon character? No, this is a real person who snuffed out human life just to prove his point. We see Satan as a premeditated murderer. All these servants, Job's children, all put to death so quickly and is so perverted that Satan allowed one person to escape to deliver the bad news. So you see, Satan has no respect for human life. But we also see a good lesson for young ones in the congregation. In verse 19, it describes Job's children as young people. It says, so that it fell on the young people and they were killed. So whether we're young or old, Satan does not care about us. Some might think, well, I'd like to go out into the world. I, would, I'm, I don't want to be a witness right now. Well, will Satan take care of you? Absolutely not. Jehovah will always take care of you, always protect you. So a good lesson for all of us, but even our young ones in the congregation. So that's one account, the account of Job. We see he's real, and we start to learn about just how wicked the, the devil is. Now, another account that we can use, and this is our second picture, is the temptation of Jesus. This, too, proves how real the devil is. Let's go to the account. We'll read it and see what we can glean from it. Let's go to Luke chapter 4. So Luke 4, we'll start with verse 1. And it says, Then Jesus, full of Holy Spirit, turned away from the Jordan, and he was led about by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by who? The devil. And he ate nothing in those days. So when they had ended, he felt hungry. At this, the devil said to him, If you are a son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus answered him, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone. So he brought him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the inhabited earth in an instant of time. Then the devil said to him, I will give you all this authority and their glory because it has been handed over to me and I give it to whomever I wish. If you, therefore, do an act of worship before me, it will all be yours. 
In reply, Jesus said to him, It is written, It is Jehovah your God you must worship, and it is to him alone you must render sacred service. He then led him into Jerusalem and stationed him on the battlement of the temple and said to him, If you are a son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will give his angels a command concerning you to preserve you, and they will carry you on their hands so that you may not strike your foot against a stone. In answer, Jesus said to him, It is said, You must not put Jehovah your God to the test. So the devil, having finished all the temptation, departed from him until another convenient time. So an interesting account. Now, was Jesus talking again to a myth, a cartoon, an imaginary monster? No. Were these temptations real? Absolutely. So we see that Satan is real. Jesus was addressing a real person. We see that he's intelligent. We see that uh, Satan knows the scriptures, although they were misapplied. And we see him as the political strategist that he truly is. So Satan offered the kingdoms of the world. They were his to offer. Jesus didn't say, well, if that's not a temptation, they're not yours to give. No, they were. So a good lesson for us is that this political system, it's so, so messed up today. Uh, it's all under Satan's control. So it's a good motivation for us not to be involved in this world's politics. So there is two accounts that really help us to see that the devil is real, but we also see that he's dangerous and that he does not love Jehovah or his people. So it's through the scriptures that explain the origin and the schemes of Satan. And some might wonder, well, why would God make the devil anyway? Why would he do that? That's just so cruel. Well, Jehovah didn't. The devil was created perfect. He had responsibility as a perfect son of God in the heavenly realm. But he rebelled in a quest for power to rule over others. Now, it's true of all of God's intelligent creatures, like ourselves, we can choose whether or not to serve Jehovah. It's our choice. Well, it's the same for the angels in heaven. So, Satan abused his freedom of choice. He allowed feelings of self-importance to develop in his heart and began to crave the worship that only belonged to Jehovah. And as a result, he enticed Adam and Eve to listen to him rather than to obey God. So really, it's by his course of action that he made himself Satan, which means adversary. Just as if a little child is born. Well, this little tiny baby... Uh, they're not automatically a, a criminal. They're not a thief or a murderer. They become such by their actions later in life. So likewise, we say, by his actions, what he did later in life, he made himself Satan. So unlike that religious, religious pamphlet we quoted at the outset, remember what it said? It says, the Bible knows nothing of such a monster of evil. We know differently, don't we? The Bible helps us to know that the devil does really exist. And going back to Julio, who we quoted earlier, he said this, he says, I did not believe in the devil for over 50 years, but then he reconsidered his views. Why? He says, and I quote, for the first time in my life, I obtained a Bible. Knowledge from the scriptures convinced me that the devil exists. So what a great source we have in God's word. But now, how does the devil operate? What does he do to keep the world of mankind subdued? And what does he do to attack Jehovah's people? Well, that's what, is, that's what we'll discuss next. So just to illustrate that, uh, think of something. This is the way Satan operates. Think of something that's very hard to detect and is dangerous. Uh, this substance, it's colorless, odorless, and can, can catch its victims unaware. And it's interesting that perhaps half of all deaths by poisoning worldwide can be linked to this one culprit. Well, what is it? Well, it's carbon monoxide poisoning. But there's no need to panic, right? There's plenty of carbon monoxide detectors readily available and in, in use. Well, like carbon monoxide, Satan, he's invisible, he's very hard to detect, and very dangerous and deadly. But Jehovah hasn't left us without the needed help. We have detectors, so to speak. So, what is that? Well, for one, we know that we are not ignorant of the devil's subtle designs. We understand that the devil and the demons, they know mankind very well. Now, to illustrate that, notice our next picture. We know that back in ancient times, Satan and the demons, they were able to materialize human bodies for themselves. Remember? Now, Jehovah took that ability away. But imagine what that means. They have the know-how. 
they have the ability to take these different elements that are here on the earth and put them together in such a way, and they were able to build and construct bodies. And they inhabited these bodies. Now these bodies, they worked. They had muscles that flexed, they had bones that could break, they had skin, eyeballs. These were so well made, they could reproduce. Now, if they know how to do that, again, they can't do it now. If they have the know-how to take these materials and put that body together, do they also have the know-how to build effective traps to keep us away from Jehovah, mankind in general, and Jehovah's people? Absolutely. Again, we're not ignorant of that fact. We know the devil has subtle designs. Well, what are they? Well, let's look at a few. Uh, first of all, we'll turn to 1 John chapter 2. So 1 John 2. And we'll look at verse 16. Okay, so again, looking at Satan's designs and his traps against us. So 1 John 2, 16, it says, Because everything in the world, and here's one, the desire of the flesh, and two, the desire of the eyes, and the showy display of one's means of life, does not originate with the Father, but originates with the world. So first, the desire of the flesh. So the desire of the flesh, that can lead one into immorality. A very effective tool of Satan. The best tool he has at his disposal. It's effective today. It was effective back in ancient times. Remember the account? The Israelites were drawn into fornication with Moabite women. Tens of thousands died. They lost their life as a result. Well, today, so many lose their spiritual lives due to this snare from the devil. So we have to be on guard against the desire of the flesh. Human tendencies have not changed. Satan's subtle designs in this area have not changed. Why change it if it works so well? So, the desire of the flesh. It also says the desire of the eyes and the showy display of one's means of life. That too can be very dangerous. Now, that could lead one to becoming slaves to materialistic pursuits. Now, is that just as dangerous? Well, think about Eve for a moment. Was Eve tempted and did she fall victim to immorality? No. That wasn't even the issue. Genesis 3.6 says that Eve saw the tree, that it was something desirable to the eyes. It was pleasing to look at. So here she fell to the desire of that, something that did not belong to her. Now, what's the point for us? Well, it's interesting that many modern pleasures that the world has to offer, they're not wrong in themselves, per se. Nothing wrong with having a nice car, a nice home, some gadgets, right? It doesn't break a Bible law to take a nice vacation now and then. So what's the point? Well, if material things, if material possessions become too important to us, well, they can start to develop within us a spirit of selfishness, materialism, and pride, and that can start to chip away at our service to Jehovah. Think about we could maybe make one big purchase. We were able to save a little bit, and we make a big purchase. But now we make another big purchase, and now we're working a little more to pay for that. Then another big purchase. Now we're working overtime. And then another big purchase, and now we have two jobs. Now we're missing our meetings. We're working overtime, our service. So if our service is slowed, if it's affected, our service to Jehovah, that's the danger. So we want to keep on guard that the desire of the eyes, the showy display, it affected Eve. And we can't take it lightly either. So two good points there from 1 John. Now in addition, there's gambling, tobacco, and drug addiction. They're all part of the devil's designs. Uh, even everyday items we tend to use more often, like the television, videos, movies, music, even our use of the internet, that too can serve Satan's purpose if we're not careful. And then what about false religion? Well, that ensnares billions of people on earth today. They may even see a ring of truth with Jehovah's people, but to break away from false religion can be very difficult. And finally, fascination with the occult, independent thinking, fear of man, they're all part of the devil's crafty acts. It almost seems like he has a long list at his disposal. It almost seems unfair. Well, Satan, he is the master opportunist, and he will not play fair, never. And since the world is under his influence... The world seems to like it that way. Really, the world's kind of the appetizer, but we are the main course when it comes to Satan's attack. So if he has all these tools against us, what does Jehovah give us to keep us well-armed? How can we successfully resist the devil and stay faithful to God? Well, one key is found here in James chapter 4. So let's take a peek. 
So James 4. And we'll read verse 7 and 8. There's a couple key points here for us. So James 4, 7 and 8. It says, therefore, subject yourselves to God. And here's our first point, but oppose the devil. So oppose the devil and he will flee from you. Second point is to draw close to God and he will draw close to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you indecisive ones. So first we want to oppose the devil. Well, how do you do that? Well, we think of a principle in Psalm 97, 10, for us to hate what is bad. So we can oppose the devil by developing a hatred for badness. It's not automatic, but it's something that we have to work on. Now, we can do that. We can start to hate what is bad by thinking ahead of time about the consequences of those actions. So let's take immorality for a moment. Let's say all of a sudden something pops up and we're tempted with immorality. And we're like, I think I can get away with this. Nobody will ever know. Ah, but wait a minute. What about the consequences? Well, first of all, damage relationship with Jehovah, number one. The possibility that we would no longer qualify to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses. What if we're married? Well, our mates are involved. What about an unwanted pregnancy? What about a transmitted disease? It's not worth it. But we need to meditate and think about those matters before a tempting situation arises. This way, if it does pop up, we have a plan of action. So, hating what is bad. We can oppose the devil by developing that uh, hatred and doing so through meditation, study, prayer. Now, in addition, we want to draw close to Jehovah. So verse 8 says, draw close to God, and he will draw close to you. So while we oppose the devil, at the same time, we continue to work on a relationship with Jehovah. That's going to keep us fortified with any pressures that come our way. So that's one way that we can stay successful. A second way has to do with the provision with regards to a pseudo-armor, spiritually speaking, that Jehovah provides. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 6. And we'll take a few points here. Ephesians 6. So Ephesians 6, and we'll look at our next image as well. Ephesians 6, verse 11 says, Put on the complete suit of armor from God, so that you may be able to stand firm against the crafty acts of the devil. And then verse 13, same point. For this reason, take up the complete suit of armor from God, so that you may be able to resist the wicked day, and after you have accomplished everything, to stand firm. So the expression is a complete suit of armor, as we see in our image. Here's this Roman soldier. He's in battle. But having a complete suit of armor, it doesn't leave any room for a sloppy attitude when it comes to our Christian Christianity. Now, think of this soldier. He's in battle. Could he be sloppy when he prepared for the day? How would this soldier fare if he prepared himself with his entire suit of armor, but he didn't like the shield, and he didn't want to wear the helmet? He could have thought, you know, this shield, it's so big and clunky. And that helmet, it's too heavy. I can't even see around. I can't see very well. I don't need him. So he prepares himself, but he doesn't have his main items of defense. How would that soldier fare? Not very well. Likewise with us. We want to have a complete suit of armor. Now, what includes? What's included in our suit of armor? Well, let's continue. Verse 14, Ephesians 4, 14. And it says, stand firm, therefore, with the belt of truth fastened around your waist, wearing the breastplate of righteousness and having our she feet shod in readiness to declare the good news of peace. Beside all of this, take up the large shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the wicked ones burning arrows. Also, accept the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit that is God's word. So our spiritual suit of armor. As we see in this image, it's pretty much our entire theocratic routine, isn't it? It includes our faith, righteousness, peace, ability to use God's word. So, the sword of the spirit, we use the Bible, we read the Bible, we want to keep abreast with uh, the faithfulness sweet slave. Our entire theocratic routine is our armor. And if we're busy in Jehovah's service, the better we are protected. So again, what a provision from Jehovah. So yes, Satan has his list of tricks, but we have, a, uh, we have excellent material to keep us faithful. Well, what are the blessings if we oppose the devil? Sometimes you might think, well, 
This is hard. Sometimes you say, I, I'm going to give up. I'm done. I'm going to throw in the towel. But if we endure and we oppose the devil, what's the result? Well, for one, living a godly life now, it does bring us peace of mind and happiness. It doesn't mean we have a problem-free life, but no, we still have peace of mind and happiness. But in addition, when we work hard to stay faithful, we also bring a smile to Jehovah's face. Notice the effect that we can have on Jehovah here in Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs 27, 11. Now again, think of the almighty in the universe, Jehovah, our God and friend. What can we do? How can we make Jehovah happy? 11 says, be wise, my son, and make my heart rejoice. How? Well, so that I can make a reply to him who taunts me. Remember with Job? Satan taunts Job. He dares him. He says, people serve you just for selfish reasons. Jehovah can say, no, Satan. You're wrong. Look at all these friends here in this congregation. Every one of them. They serve me. Why? Because they love me. Because of your faithfulness, Jehovah can say, Satan, you're a liar. We have that privilege. What a privilege to be able to help Jehovah with that answer. Well, just thinking of that can just be an awesome thing. Also, we can be among those who can have the prospect of surviving the Great Tribulation. Imagine enjoying this prospect of everlasting life in God's new world of righteousness and to experience firsthand. We'll, we'll be able to see with our own eyes the grand fulfillment of Jehovah's purpose. Well, that's ours if we stay faithful to Jehovah. So it can be difficult, but the blessing is worth all the work. So in our discussion, in a nutshell, what do you think? Is there really a devil? Is the devil no more real than that child's imaginary monster just hiding underneath the bed? Well, as we've seen from the Bible, not only is there a devil, but he's powerful, and he does not care about any of us here in this hall. So let us do our utmost at opposing the devil. Yes, let's fight as hard as we can so as not to be ensnared in any method of operation. If we do so, only rich and everlasting blessings will result.